On this earth, we find ourselves collected together with an immense number of people, some of them good, others bad. Then there are the believing Christians, and then there are the infidels who even go as far as mocking the very existence of the God who created them. There are those who defend God's church and those who persecute it. There are those who profess the true faith and would shed their very blood for it. And there are those who are separated from the one true fold of Christ's one and only church. All of these groups living together with almost no mark to distinguish them. But there will be a time when we shall see the eternal separation of light and darkness. The gospel of the wheat and the cockle that we read some time ago assures us of this very fact. Our Lord says, Let the good seed grow with the cockle until the harvest. Then I will say to the reapers, Gather up first the cockle and bind it into bundles to burn, but gather the wheat into my barn. The reapers symbolize the angels who will come at the end of time to gather up the elect. The good seed represents the just, while the cockle represents the wicked men who are not worthy of God. They will be taken into bundles and burned in the Lord's barn. But he also compares, in other parables, the just to sheep and the unjust to goats. And he tells them at the end of the time, he bids the sheep to come to my right and to the goats, the sinners, go to my left. That is, the right or left of the cross which at the end of the world will send forth its rays to announce the coming of Christ. It is the cross that on that last day divides the wicked from the good. Each one of us, without exception, will be there. We will either rejoice at the appearance of the cross, or we will see it as a sign of woe, a sign of fear and anxiety, a sign of despair. It can then only be a sign of joy if, while we lived on earth, we constantly rallied around the cross as a standard. We fought beneath the flag of the cross all during our life, then, at the end of time, the appearance of the cross in the sky will be a source of joy. Then the sign of the Son of Man in heaven will be just that. St. Lawrence Justinian, when he was a young man and deciding his vocation, he took a crucifix And he fell on his knees before it. And while he contemplated the image of Christ on the cross, he imagined then all of the riches, the honors, and the pleasures that he could legitimately expect from working in the world. And then, on the other hand, he considered all of the beautiful treasures which the faith gives, those treasures which will last not for a day, not for a month or a year, but will last for all eternity, world without end. And he compared the riches of earth with the glories of heaven, all the time kneeling before his crucifix. And then he looked at the image of the crucified Lord and asked, Lord, what shall I do? Then grace led him to trample underfoot all the worldly things, even legitimate ones, and to become perfect 
to strive after perfection in the spiritual life so as to, to merit a most exalted place in heaven. And along his way, striving for perfection, he never faltered, he never wavered, he kept moving forward because he had, he had now made up his mind, resolved firmly to serve Christ. And now, after all those years of trial and temptation and suffering, fighting against his own inclinations, now he enjoys perfect bliss for all eternity. At this moment, as you sit in church, St. Lawrence has been through all that you're going through now. He's up there in heaven seeing the most beautiful scene that anyone could ever mention. This saint is not the only one to have resolved to serve God in the most perfect manner. Many do the same. Perhaps you have made this resolution to serve God not only well, but perfectly. But not all persevere. They begin well, but then the path of perfection, they realize, is narrow. It's covered with thorns. While the road to ruin, well, it's broad. And it's lined with beautiful roses which only hide the thorns from your sight. And you pick one and you only find out afterwards that it's not as beautiful as you had imagined. The unstable Christian wavers in his resolution to be holy, and too often then gives up the pursuit of sanctity because of some difficulty experienced, perhaps because of humiliations, sufferings, and so on and so forth. Now, Christ himself, God made man, received humiliation, and public scorn while he heard from the mob on Palm Sunday, he heard the shouts, crucify him. Those very people then shouting for his crucifixion, remember, were the exact same ones who days before cried out to our Lord, Hosanna to the Son of David. On that day, on Palm Sunday, with their, with their palms in hand, they resolved fidelity to Christ the King. But then somewhere in the next week, they wavered, and they faltered, and they fell to crucify their God. Think of this scene whenever you're tempted and go, to go back on your resolution to serve God and God alone. The kingdom of heaven, remember, is gained by violence. There is a struggle, a fight, sometimes severe and long and drawn out, but it must be that way. There are temptations which threaten to destroy even the virtue which has been built up for many decades. One temptation can destroy a life of work. In the soul. So when we set out on our journey to heaven, we must be firm. We must not allow temptations to cause us to waver or to falter. We must keep renewing our intentions to serve God not only well, but perfectly, if we wish to become saints. And for this end, look at your crucifix. How often they're forgotten about. They hang on the wall in some room and you pass them every now and again. But take it off the wall, hold it in your hands, and contemplate Jesus crucified. And as you contemplate how Christ suffered for you, you will regain your strength. To look at the cross of Christ will fill the soul with holy affections and it will produce holy desires in your heart. 
or how can it fail to produce feelings of, of awe, for example, when we reflect that the cross will one day appear in the heavens to give witness to the justice of God in deciding the eternal fate of millions and millions of souls who tremble in God's sight. One glance at our crucifix should remind us that we are to be either eternally happy or eternally miserable. Either or. These are two very small and simple words, but most important for your salvation. When St. Gabriel the Archangel comes on the last day to sound the trumpet, it will penetrate into the very depth of your grave. Your body will obey the summons, and wherever it is laying, in a cemetery or elsewhere, whether it has been desecrated and burned to ash or buried holily, your body will obey the summons. It will arise, and it will arise either glorious and beautiful, or it will be horrible and disfigured before all men, either or. Either your body will arise to be joined to a blessed and happy soul, or to be united to an inhabitant of hell. This alone should be enough to motivate us to serve God with everything that we've got. The gates then, on that last day, the gates of heaven and the gates of hell will both swing open. And above, when you look in to the gates of heaven, you'll see joys and beauties which no man, however holy he be, can describe. And below, what a horrid scene that if we only saw we would die of fright. But from above, we will be, will be seeing the blessed soul, your blessed soul, if you persevere in serving God, descending, being accompanied with your guardian angel to be reunited to this body, which has been the shell, you might say, to the soul. And they will be reunited for all eternity, what joy, either or. Christ will send His angels to separate on that day the wheat from the cockle, the good from the bad, and you will be taken to Christ's right or to His left. Either you will hear the words of our Lord, Depart from me, ye cursed, or come, ye blessed of my Father. There is no third option. But this thought of today should not lead us to discouragement. Remember, not all saints started out well, but every one of them ended well. Look upon your crucifix then, frequently, and contemplate it. Contemplate that God died for me. Contemplate the very love of the Sacred Heart that moved, that made him desire to be hung on a cross as if a thief, to shed every last drop of his blood till he had nothing left but some little water in his veins that shot out when Longinus pierced his side with a, with a lance that it was love that made him do that. Love for me, for you. And then when fear for salvation comes, for your salvation comes, remember Our Lady and say to her with the greatest confidence, remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it heard that anyone who fled to thee for protection was left unaided. And then clutch your cross. For if you're a friend of the cross in this world, then the, the cross of Christ 
when it appears at the end of time, will be a joyful sight for you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.